I wonder how many people just know the bad aspects of the story and not when it looked like he was ready to dominate this league. So with us right now to have this discussion, Dallas Mavericks, great, super pumped to have him on today. Rolando Blackman, good morning, sir. And it is a good morning to you guys, that's for sure. It's a, it's a good morning. I'm happy to be on. Man, Ro, you had such a great career, and I was a kid in the 80s and just loving the Dallas Mavericks and you guys are building towards something special. You guys have the second best record behind the Lakers in 1987. Unfortunately, your former teammate Dell Ellis and and the Sonics knock you out. And then the next year, yes. you guys uh, you guys struggle down the stretch and you end up being the three seed, but you make it to the Western Conference Finals. I'm kind of setting up the audience here just how great you guys were. And during that 1987-88 season, I know you dealt with some injuries there. Uh, Aguirre and Donaldson make the all-star team, and Roy Tarpley win sixth man of the year. Can you kind of talk to us about that team and how great that team was? Because Jeff Van Gundy brought up and Mark Jackson brought up that team Sunday on the telecast. Well, what's important about all of that is that the important thing is that every everyone on that basketball team was a, a serious veteran and, and somebody who could command their position and being able to do a great job in playing the game but when you talk about Mark, of course, everybody knows about Mark McGuire, our, our, our leading scorer, our, our command post guy, being able to put the ball together. And, and of course, James Donaldson, which, which was one of the best centers in the league at the time, maybe all-star team blocking shots, taking care of the middle for us, and, and, and really being cerebral in setting screens and the things that he had to get done. Roy was a guy that was just, just uh, completely unstoppable simply because, of first of all, his skill level to dribble the ball, shoot step backs, shoot jumpers, drive the ball to the basket, rebound the ball, and also just a nasty tenacity on the court. There's a difference when you get on the court uh, and play the game at the power forward, and, and sometimes you play the center position, I'm talking about Roy, is that when you go up against guys like Oakley, Barkley, people who were tough and nasty in the game, nobody messed with Roy at all because it was not only an affront, but also a guy that would be able to be in a commanding position when it gets to the physical side of the game. So he'd jump out there and get 20 rebounds, 18 rebounds, 12 rebounds, 11. He'd, he'd be out there doing his thing and was a kind of a, a force onto his, himself to being able to be on the team that way too. So it really, really made our team a, a, a very, very good basketball team, especially when it come, came down to uh, skill basketball and then when it got to the dirty nasty of uh, playing in the trenches. Did did that so did that allow you because of who he was? Did that allow you guys to be a little I, I don't know, maybe take a little more or give a little more? I think I think when you talk about the game at that time, you have to have all the skills at, at, at all the different positions with me and Harp in the backcourt, uh, followed by Brad Davis as far as all of that's concerned, to being able to have veterans on the team. It it just allows you to play the game at a higher level when you have guys that can do it all. You're talking about Mark, and then you're talking about Roy shooting the ball, rebounding, playing the game, um, and, and, and James Donaldson taking care of the, the low block, Derek doing his thing, just, just causing fits all over the stuff. And I'm, and I'm the two guard on the, on the, on the other side uh, uh, playing, at a, playing at a high level. It just, it just gave us a strong and just a formidable basketball team to being able to take on all aspects of the game. And that's what allowed us to – to go down there and uh, and play the Lakers in, in that kind of a way, a real, a really, a really, uh, and an, an a Hall of Fame basketball team, including the Lakers bench that we have to go up against. So it, it was a lot of fun, guys. A lot of fun. A busted lip was a lot of fun back in the day. <laughs> I I know it might take enough time for an entire podcast just talking about that Western Conference Finals, but we've been talking about the show winning time and Mike's been reading the book Showtime about those Lakers, but y'all almost put that momentum to a stop in 88. Can you kind of walk us through, I guess, a couple more of those ebbs and flows in that series and maybe what the vibe is going to game seven, knowing that, hey, we got to go into the forum, but we're one win away from going to the NBA finals. You know, when I explain these things to people, and, I, and, I've, and I've done that over the years, it's been, it's been very difficult simply because it's, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think fans or people really are, are fans as far as that understand the incredible intensity that you have to have going into these games and the duration that you have to keep it. It's 48 minutes. 
So everybody needs to understand that, that you get into these type of basketball games where you have power against power, meaning great team against another great team. And when you get into those type of things, you've got to win your games. We won our, our games at home. Uh, 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 they won their games at home. And then when, when, we, when we came out back to, to Dallas, fellas, fellas, you know you've got to win those games at home. This is no, this is no fooling around if and or but. And, and they're coming to take it from you, and you've got to be able to act as, as, if, as if somebody's coming to take something from you. It's got to be the dirty, nasty has to come out. And you have to be able to execute and play as a team at a high level. So you're talking about those games three and four in Dallas, which was raucous, but it was physical and it was nasty, rebounding, grabbing loose balls, making passes, defending plays. And next thing you know, uh, next thing you know, fellas, it's, uh, it's two and two going back to L.A. And it's just, just a, it's just an opportunity to understand that you have to have your team, you have to be in focus. And, fellas, you got to be healthy. You can't be thinking about people who are injured or people who are, who are not going to be able to play at full speed because that breaks down your mentality when you're in a game against the top team. You can't be thinking about somebody else or thinking about my ankle is hurting me and if I could have would. you you got to be on it now. And that's just the way it is. And the important fact is that if you want to win, you've got to come with the top-line players and everybody has to know what to do already. All this implementing people late in the season and late in the game, you've got to be able to have plays called. You've got to be able to make plays, sometimes on the intuition of having done it over and over again. Because defenses change, defenses try to change different things, and you've got to be able to go out there and understand that you've got to get to the options as a normal part of the play you just called. They do one thing, you do the next, but you've done it over and over again, and you've got to do it knowing that the outcome is going to be a good thing. Just like we all, we all right now, and, I, and, I'm, and I'll switch off for a second, we all, we all know, we all love watching Luca and Powell. Man, that's yes. fun. Mm-hmm. Man, is it going to be over the top? Is it going to be a bounce pass late? Is it going to be a wraparound? Is it going to be something else that they suck the defense down so much that pow, here comes that pass to one of the shooters, Bullock, out there shooting the basketball out of the, out of the corner. You've you, you got Finney Smith taking shots from, from, from the wing. You know, those are the type of things when you go on. So in playing against the Lakers, it was nip and tuck. They won their game. We came back in the sixth game here and won by a few points. And then it was the seventh game up in, up, up in, up in L.A. And when you get to a seventh game, man, damn it. You know what I mean? You get to a seventh game, and you've got to be able to do the best you possibly can mm. to uh, – jump on out there and get the win. But it's all at high intensity. It's all at no excuses after. And it's all at doing it all together. Everybody has to have their format and being able to play the game at, at, that, at that pace. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a big deal if you, if you, if, if, if you want to get through. And uh, the Lakers beat us in that series in the seventh game in L.A. In, in that seventh game at halftime, it is a one-point game. And like you said, the home team had won every single game. Clearly, the Lakers had this pedigree of going to the finals. Are you sitting in there at halftime? Do you feel like this team was sitting in there at halftime saying, we're going to win this game? Yeah, you, but you, you're, you're there analyzing the things that are going on on the court, different options that are happening, what's actually working. What's actually not? Because I, at, the, at the end of the day, a play is just a format. I, off of that format come the options. Can you be coordinated on the options when you come down time and time again? Remember, it's a 24-second interval. You've got to make those plays and those changes and those options have to be there, but it has to be coordinated. i got to be thinking about it, and so do you. At the same time, in that moment, to being able to get past the defense who may be doing something else. It is, listen, guys, it is so much fun, man. It is so much fun mm. to be on that court at the highest intensity levels and trying to show your wares, but also trying to do something for your team, your town, your teammates, your family. It's a, look, it's a, it's a, it's a really special time. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm looking forward hopefully too for, for our Mavs to, uh, uh. to raise to that level. At the end of the day, because at the end of the day, they have a superstar in Luca, uh, one, one of the one, one, one of the top three, four players in the league today. Period. And the important factor, playing off of that, is going to give you an option. It's going to give you a step. It's going to give you the ball in your hands 
the defense is rotating. What are you going to do with it? Shoot the ball, hit, repenetrate, pass, whatever it is, you have a guy that's, uh, that, that's a brand superstar. And I mean a real superstar also, too, not just somebody putting stuff on him to make it look good. He is a bad boy in-house. <laughs> so in that, it should raise and elevate you to being able to do your job, first of all, and then do your job with an advantage. Which, woohoo! <laughs> that's, that's the kind of stuff I'd live for, yes. baby. Come on over here. Double him. Look at me. I'm going to have to rotate this ball. I might, I might shoot the ball with NBA in your face. <laughs> <laughs> Dallas Maverick, Maverick legend uh, Rolando Blackman joining us. Ro, I want to go back to after you lose Game 7 in 1988. During that series, Pat Riley says, we have no answer for Roy Tarpley. You probably, I mean, you kind of know where Roy Tarpley is in his life and how great he is in his second year in the NBA. Did you feel like this guy's going to, you're the leader of the Dallas Mavericks at the time. Did you feel like this young man is going to lead us to an NBA championship or were you worried about him maybe taking over a big leadership role at that time in his life? Man, the guy was, I kept, I told him to his face that, and look, you, you keep practicing, playing, staying focused on what you need to get accomplished is that you'll be a perennial, perennial all-star jump out to all NBA and have the opportunity to, to, to be able to be a great lead lead on this team. The important factors with things guys is that with, with, with great responsibility, you've got it with, with great, with great talent, there comes a great responsibility. And the important factors with all of that is that you're, you're still a human being. This is not a computer game. This is not easy to just, Go do this. Go do that. You have to make decisions. You've played a great game. You've done great things. You got to make a decision. Are you going to go out after the game, knowing you got a game the next night, and go party and go drink down alcohol, or go do the things that will be detrimental not only to your game, but also to the team? You've got to make you got to make big boy decisions, and with that comes the opportunity for major responsibility. And sometimes, with all the greatest talent that Roy had, greatest talent. Because when you talk about shooting the ball, rebounding the ball, running the court, making passes, there's, there's no big man better than him uh, running around the NBA at that time with, with his talent. But you've got to be able to curb the outside influences, your friends coming from Michigan, your nightlife situations, your inability to take care of the things that you know would be detrimental. And on that side of life, Roy did not handle those, those things very well. And it made it very difficult because it, it was the end detriment for him in his life and for our basketball team to lose such a great, great talent. Now, Ro, I want to talk about today's game versus your game. If you were playing today, they would expect you, Ro, to shoot five to seven three-pointers a night. How often in the 80s and early 90s did you even practice shooting three-pointers uh, during, during kind of your, your habits and your practice schedule? No, I didn't start to I didn't start to shoot a whole bunch of three pointers till later on in my career. You know, you don't have to shoot three pointers if you can get to the cup. You don't have to. I mean, the, the main factor with the NBA and all the analytics and the things that are going on right now is that it's that it's a it's an excellent shot if you have a a fantastic opportunity like where we have it right now. We played a different basketball game than that playing now with the top roll, pick and roll, pick and roll the top, collapsing defenses, shooting behind the screens, making sure and collapsing and, and, sh- and passing the basketball to the open corners or the, or the wings for three-point shooting shots to being able to put it together. But for me, and, and, to, and for some of a lot of the other players, me, Richard Jefferson, and as you can see right now, DeMar DeRozan, get, you, you can get to a certain area and shoot the ball, score a lot, shoot a high percentage, I shot 50% for my career in the 80s where you were bump and run, punching them in the face, hit them in the leg, hit them in the stuff, got kind of stuff. All that kind of stuff is going on, and you still have to make your shot. So it's just a different game. The applied science is that you elevate to the things that are needed, and you practice those things during the summer, and you, and you elevate those things to the game that you have to get accomplished depending on how the team plays. So right now you've got the big pick-and-roll games, and everybody's standing around outside and – uh, waiting to shoot shots, so that's the way the game is right now. All of us great players would have adjusted. That's for daggone sure. Mm. We would have we would have adjusted to be able to make it make things happen because everybody's a everybody can fly, but not everybody's an eagle. Uh, oh. Rolando, the uh, like that. you know Mark, Mark McGuire didn't talk much about leaving Dallas and, and everything there, but I did hear him recently say that while he was here, 
you know, he would he would play pickup games, you know, just in the city. He'd just go find a park and he'd start playing, and those fans would show up to the the, the arena, you know, because they they got to play in a game with him that night. He got to know him by name and everything. And I'm just kind of curious. You've been here this entire time, and you've seen this city grow. How much has has Dallas changed? And were you were you out there playing pickup games like that too back in the '80s? Are you are you kidding me? Man, look, look, I'm from Brooklyn, New York City. Are you, are you kidding me? Are you talking about hooping? You, you Listen, when you're a hooper, man, you put your in, – in the summertime, don't play that much and stay on the track and you don't get hurt, man. You, you look at the person in their face like, man, you must, man, move away from me. The important factor with a hooper <laughs> is that you're going to lay your stuff on the line. Mm-hmm. You see the stories with Kevin Durant all over the place going and play everywhere all over the place. That's exactly what we did right here at Martin Luther King. We were right there in the summertime where they had the Poe Bill basketball tournament. Poe Bill! We had the tournaments in, in Martin Luther King Recreation Center in South Dallas. We'd go up there and play basketball, play the game. Uh, we'd be running around trying to go through. Nobody's thinking about anything else except for get your game on and making sure that you advance in what you needed to come. You had your gym workouts to get your game on what you didn't do well or what you could advance on. And then you get out there and play. And you've got to play in the right environments also, too. And what I mean the right environment is that you've got to play where people are coming at you. You've got to play where people are not scared and they're running around. This is not a club game. This is not, this is not a club game as far as that's concerned. This is a game where it's raw. And if you do that, like we did in the summer times, it was sweet to go out there because you got guys who thought, well, I could have been a pro and I wanted to be a pro. I could have played against you. I could have did that. Well, baby. Come get some. <laughs> Come Man. get some. Come get some. So, so, and that's, that's the way it would be. And it would be so much fun to be out there running up and down the court uh, and, 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 and having an opportunity and get a chance to, to, to see everybody. Because we were right out there on the stoop on the steps drinking Coca-Cola, eating, eating uh, chicken salad sandwiches and having some chips. And then, and then after that, you go right back in there and get some hoops and you play. You're just, you're just in the environment of a hoop, of a hooper. And those, those are the fun times where you get involved with the fans and everybody else all around who hoops in Dallas and, and get a chance to be ingrained in the city. I've been here since 1981. Uh, it's, been, it's been fantastic to watch the city grow and, and of course, watch all the, all the great players, all the dirts. And then now with this, with, this, with this thing called Luka Doncic. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. You know what I mean? It's been so much fun to watch so many great greatness uh, all around, too. So I'm enjoying the game. I'm watching the games, enjoying them, watching them, analyzing, and just uh, putting, putting myself in, in that place of, of listening and understanding what's going on because I know what they're going through. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm going to see who can step up to the plate when the, when the actual time comes. Bright lights, baby. Uh, it's not going to be 40 watts. It's going to be 200 watts. So can you see through that light? Man, we appreciate having you on so much today, and we would love to talk with you again as the Mavericks progress through the playoffs. Thank you very much for your time, good sir. Tremendous, guys. Take take good care of yourselves, and thanks for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, bro. There you go. Rolando Blackman right here on Check 105.3 Mark. The Fan. <laughs> Holy Interviewed cow. Interviewed my childhood hero there. <laughs> Man. His answer about, are you kidding me? I'm from Brooklyn, New York. And I was like, God. That's and a Hooper mentality, can, that's, dude. Well, not that. That's also a New Yorker because they will let you know where they're from. I could envision <laughs> the story he was telling about uh-huh. that. And, oh, my gosh. And I, Reggie loves him. Kansas State guy. Let's mm-hmm. go. We, 